Coming to you from Beaumont, this is your house call. Let me set the stage for you. It's Michigan, late autumn. Really, it could be anywhere in the world, but for the sake of argument and for my own convenience, let's just say we're in Michigan. So you notice the days are getting shorter, there's less daylight, you're leaving to go to work in the dark and you're coming home in the dark. And as a result of this, your sleep-wake cycle, or what's known as the circadian rhythm, is all tripped up. You find yourself feeling a little more tired, so you're sleeping more than usual. And you also notice that it's a little harder to avoid the carbs this time of year, so the pants might be getting a little tighter. You're quickly losing interest in the things that seemed so much easier to do just a couple months ago when the weather was nice, like going to the gym or going out with friends. You know, simply put, you're just a little more bummed out than usual. Maybe you're depressed. There's a name for this. It's called seasonal affective disorder. It's a real condition with real symptoms and real diagnostic criteria and real treatment options. And that's what today's talk is all about. Hello and welcome to the Beaumont House Call Podcast. I'm Dr. Nick Gilpin. Today we're talking about seasonal affective disorder, also known as its abbreviation SAD, and sometimes called seasonal depression. It's generally thought to be more than just the, quote, winter blues that many of us experience. Studies have found that the lifetime prevalence of this condition, meaning the percentage of people who have experienced this at some point in their life, is somewhere between one and 3%. Now that might sound low, but in the U.S., that's really somewhere between 500,000 and a million people that will experience this condition. We're lucky enough to have an expert on this topic in the studio with us today. That's Dr. Shella Jaffrey. Dr. Jaffrey is a family practice doctor affiliated with Beaumont and an assistant professor in family medicine at the Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine. She was named the Michigan Academy of Family Physicians Educator of the Year in 2016, which is incredibly cool. She's also lectured and spoken on this topic in the past, including on local Metro Detroit television. Our chat today will be focused on a few key areas. First off, we'll introduce the who, what, when, where, and why of seasonal affective disorder. Next, we'll get all clinical and talk about the symptoms of seasonal affective disorder and how it may be different from other forms of depression. And then we'll get into how to know if you or someone who's close to you might have this condition, aka how to make the diagnosis of seasonal affective disorder. And lastly, we'll talk about treatment and management strategies. So with that, I will welcome our guest to the podcast, Dr. Shella Jaffrey. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Good to have you here in the studio. Full disclosure, I think it should be mentioned, you and I recently bumped into each other uh, at a meeting or a lecture, and I think you had suggested that this you're a fan of the podcast and... That, uh, so thank you for that. You also mentioned that you know maybe a good topic to have would be something on seasonal affective disorder. So you pitched this idea to me, and so here we are today talking about this. So tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do, and specifically tell me why this topic is of interest to you. I'm a board-certified family medicine physician, mm -hmm. and I'm a faculty preceptor at the Beaumont Health Family Medicine Residency Programs. And I'm a native of Michigan, so I've seen this a lot um, clinically, professionally, and with my patients. And it's something near and dear to my heart because it's something that is totally treatable and people should live and enjoy the winter time here in Michigan. So I wanted to let it out there before Thanksgiving and Christmas rolled around and people are enjoying to their full effect that they can enjoy. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I should, this is a good place to point out that I too am a lifelong Michigan resident. So when uh, talking about this, I'm certainly going to be speaking from a little bit of my own heart as well. You know, let's jump into this. So uh, can you define what seasonal affective disorder is for the non-physician? Sure. It's a type of depression that displays a recurring seasonal pattern. So it usually starts in the fall when the leaves start changing and you're like, oh great, winter's coming. Hmm. And then you get like the quote unquote winter blues and then it starts resolving when the snow starts melting and spring comes. Um, to quote unquote meet the criteria for it, you have to have it for two years more frequently than non-seasonal depression. So it happens every winter for you. So is it basically the same as as a 
clinical depression that just happens to occur in wintertime? Exactly. It's no. more, uh, it's seasonal affective disorder. Mm. So there is a winter, but there also is a summer subset. It's mm. in the family of depression. But the best way to get diagnosed is to see your healthcare provider or clinical psychologist so they can see which symptoms you have and rule out other disorders. Now, how is SAD different from what we probably all have experienced, at least those of us that live in this part of the world, the quote-unquote winter blues that you mentioned, uh, when the days start to get shorter and the weather starts to get a little crappier, we all feel a little down in the dumps. Is there a difference between seasonal affective disorder and that experience? Definitely. We okay. all have um, some winter blues when it's cold outside or, you know, it's the freezing rain and you don't want to go to work that day, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But when this is happening all the time, every day, you're feeling down for days on end, you're not motivated to go outside, you're not enjoying the activities you would normally do, like go hang out with your friends, go um, see things you love doing, you notice like an increase in appetite, you want to sleep more. And some people sometimes turn to alcohol for comfort and you're just feeling hopeless, sad, and it's just a consistent feeling more days than not. And it's interfering with your family relationships. It's interfering with work. Then definitely please call your healthcare professional. Sure. So in other words, when it really starts to affect your function, your ability to function totally. as a member of society, then we've got a problem. Yes. When it's day in and day out, more days than not days. So uh, let me, this is a curious question mm -hmm. for me. You know, thinking about seasonal affective disorder and the fact that most sufferers of seasonal affective disorder experience this in the winter time. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is there an evolutionary advantage to this in some way? For instance, the winter time comes, we start to conserve energy, we we may start to sleep more. Um, is this something that's just kind of encoded into us? I believe so. Back in the day, it probably was good when there was less sunlight to hibernate sure. and sleep through that time as a protective mechanism, like for animals. Mm -hmm. But as we're evolving and through evolution, um, the circadian rhythm, the sunlight that we have during the day, that affects our physiological and behavioral changes. So our response to the light and day environment. So when the seasons change, we have less sunlight. And I think that has an effect on people with them feeling more sluggish because there is a link with increasing melatonin hmm. and that's the chemical that helps you sleep. And that's why you're a little bit more sleepier. You wake up in the dark, you're driving home in the dark. Um, also with less sunlight, you also have less vitamin D. Mm -hmm. That's another theory, vitamin D, melatonin. And then there's a neurotransmitter in our brain, which is serotonin. And they're saying when there's less sunlight, there's less serotonin, so there's less of that uplifting mood. So there's multiple theories on it, and I believe you know, it's part of a puzzle piece in which one fits different people. So circadian rhythm clearly plays a role. Mm -hmm. uh, neurotransmitters play a role. Correct. Probably somewhere, some combination of both of those variables together sort of forms this perfect union of why we get seasonal effective, right? I think it's just, you know, the decreased sunlight. So your body resets your biological clock, which affects your sleep, your mood, and your hormones. Mm -hmm. At the same time with decreased sunlight, we have less serotonin. That's the neurotransmitter in our brain that elevates our mood. Mm -hmm. And then when there's decreased sunlight, there's also more melatonin, and then you feel more sluggish and sleepy. So if I was going to build sort of the prototype patient who gets seasonal affective disorder? Is this, uh, somewhat, is this something that affects certain ages more than others? Is this something that affects one uh, sex or gender more than another? I mean, tell me about the, the sure. prototype patient. Um, like you said in the intro, their lifetime prevalence is about 3%. And in a primary care setting, about 5 to 10% of the patients do have seasonal affective disorder. And if you suffer from depression, um, depressed patients have a 15% percent chance of being more depressed in the winter time. So anybody can get it, but um, younger people are more susceptible than older people to get seasonal affective disorder, hmm. and even children and adolescents can get it. Women are four times more likely than men to get it, and then people that live further away from the equator, north or south of it, have a higher incidence of seasonal affective disorder because they get less sunlight throughout the day. Sure. Now that makes sense. I was actually going to ask that question. So 
so it stands to reason the further north I am, the further I am from the equator. So I guess then I'm going to ask another silly question. I'm thinking about some of the happiest, quote unquote, countries in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Like the Scandinavian countries right. are, are chronically ranked among the happiest places mm-hmm. to live. But they also get a pretty disproportionately low amount of mm-hmm. sunlight. Mm-hmm. Can you, how do you square that? I'm thinking they must eat healthy. They yeah. must exercise. It might be part of their genetics or their DNA. Um, there's always, you know, risk factors with family history and um, your social circle. Maybe they're more social. They exercise regularly. But I think it's a combination. There's no one answer for one person. Okay. So as a doctor, you've taken care of patients with seasonal affective disorder before. What are the symptoms that you're looking for? We touched on this just a minute, but but tell me a little bit more about the symptoms if you suspect a person might have seasonal affective disorder. Sure. Um, they'll come in complaining of low energy I'm sleeping more, I'm eating more, I've been gaining weight, craving carbs. The biggest thing is the social withdrawal, someone who's social and they just don't want to go out. So I always check and make sure they don't have a history of depression, make sure they don't have underlying anxiety. But there are other um, diseases that can be correlated and um, hopefully they're not abusing alcohol, they don't have an eating disorder. premenstrual syndrome, social anxiety, or a personality disorder. So it's not something we can Google and diagnose ourselves. It's best if we go talk to a healthcare professional or licensed psychologist to help weed through the symptoms and see which subset we fit or if there's multiple things going on, like with your social situation, your family situation, Mm -hmm. knowing your family history is very important, and just, you know, your diet, exercise, hydration. Now, us physicians, we, we love our screening tools and our, our inventories and our checklists yes. and our scoring systems. And mm-hmm. Is there something like that that's out there for seasonal affective disorder? There is. And okay. as you said, it's a screening tool. So it only screens you. It's a seasonal pattern assessment questionnaire. And it gives you points on your sleep, social activity, mood, weight, appetite, and energy. So it's only a screening tool. Mm. So if you score high for it, you need to get interv- you know, interviewed by a clinician to see if this is the accurate diagnosis for you or not. Make sure the other top three things we worry about is depression, bipolar depression, or a personality disorder. Okay. And again, we, we got to specify or we got to clarify that there are varying degrees of where someone will fall Correct. on the spectrum, right? Very so. true. Yes. Yeah, so some people have mild, some people do better just by getting extra sunlight. Some people do better by taking vitamin D and a multivitamin. Some people do better by, all right, Saturday, I'm going to have that lunch with my girlfriend or I'm going to go ice skating. So there's different degrees of a disease and how you can be treated for it. Well, that segues really well because I, now that we've sort of talked about diagnosis and we've talked a little bit about the pathophys and we've talked about all that important stuff, you know, sort of background, now let's get a little bit into treatment. So what is the treatment for seasonal affective disorder? There are multiple treatments, and there are four major ones that come to mind right now. The mainstream is the light therapy, and it's a special lamp, which I'll go into details in Mm -hmm. a second. Um, The second one I really firmly believe in is the psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, sort of identifying your negative thoughts and trying to switch them to positive. It's called behavioral activation. Um, I also believe in the vitamin D, the multivitamin, the supplements. Go to your doctor and tell them, you know, if you're tired, make sure you're not anemic. Make sure you don't have a, you know, hypothyroidism. There could be some underlying endocrine or metabolic causes for the seasonal affective. And then um, there's also medications. But any one or all can work for people. It depends on the patient and their problem and their diagnosis. And I've seen people, you know, get treated with one or all or a combination. So you mentioned light first. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about light therapy because that's something I've, I'm not super familiar with. Mm -hmm. I've read about it. I've never personally prescribed it to someone before. So tell me how light therapy works. So there's a lamp called a Lux light lamp Mm -hmm. and it um, filters out the UV light. So you only get the Lux light. You need 10,000 Lux. And you're not supposed to put it too close to you, keep it away. But first thing when you wake up, you go under the light for about even 10, 15 minutes, and you slowly increase the amount. So this, some patients recover within a few days by using this light therapy, because you're waking up, it's dark outside. So you're Mm -hmm. getting the artificial light, which affects your brain chemistry and your mood. And I've seen people 
do really well with it. I've seen it at people's desks in the clinic, at the research labs. There's a lot more Lux lamps out there than we know. Where does one get one of these lamps? You can go to your buddy Amazon, yeah. Costco. There are certain companies, but please research it and make sure it's 10,000 Lux. There's different brands and types. There's some that stand, some that go on the table, and some are just like a light box. And some people watch TV and you know put it away two, free, two feet away from them. While they're watching their morning news, they're getting the light and they feel much better. So that's the principle here then is I, I take this this light box, I set it up somewhere in the morning, mm -hmm. early-ish in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, a couple feet away from me. Mm -hmm. Two how, feet. <laughs> how long? Well, they say initially to start out with 10 minutes, just like with exercise, start slow. So okay. 10 to 15 minutes is the initial amount. And um, we've seen people therapeutic between 30 to 45. So it depends on the patient. Some people feel better after 10, 15 minutes. Some people need 30 minutes. So that's also variable. But most of the studies say somewhere between 30 to 45 minutes is a sweet spot to get that light and you need. Is there any value to doing this at other times during the day? I believe it is. Some people are more, you know, night owls, night shift workers. Mm. And when they wake up in the evening and they do it, they're more productive at work that night. I think any time, like if I had to use it, I'd use it at lunchtime. So yeah. I can just get that extra burst to keep going throughout the day. Yeah, sounds good. Now, the next thing you mentioned was cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. So tell me how you sort of incorporate that into your treatment plan for someone with seasonal affective disorder. Well, I'm very fortunate for the clinics where I work in our residency program. We have um, licensed psychologists at a PhD or master's level, and they come in with the resident or the physician to talk to the patient. So you can see a physician and a um, psychologist at the same time. We do have co-counseling appointments. And... Um, you find out there's other things that are going on that might be contributing to the seasonal affective disorder. But the best way to do it is check the back of your insurance card. They always have a number for mental health yep. and see who your nearest physician is. And there are a lot of free clinics in the area, too, if you call your doctor's office or look them up. In every county, there are resources for mental health. Now, are you sort of implementing this in a stepwise approach, or is this like let's try the light first and see how we do. And if we're not getting anywhere, then maybe we'll try some CBT. It depends on the patient. So I'd okay. have to see the patient, get a thorough history. So be honest with your doctor. Tell them how you're feeling, what's going on, what symptoms you're having, and let them know a little bit about your family history and other medical problems. It's almost like a little menu. You, depend, you have to see what your patient's receptive to, get some lab work, make sure there isn't an underlying deficiency or a metabolic disorder. And then you work on it together as a treatment plan. But I would definitely get, ask them for light therapy, see if they're receptive to medications or, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy. But I think it's a team approach, what the patient is willing to do and what the doctor seems is best for the patient. The next thing that you mentioned was something like vitamin D or some mm -hmm. supplements mm -hmm. that might be beneficial. And yes. I think that that's a very important point because before you launch into this you know, this this grand scale treatment plan or mm -hmm. this grand workup for someone who has depression, I think the first thing you want to do is look for some of those organic causes like yes. vitamin D deficiency, mm -hmm. which is pretty common in Michigan this time of year where we live. I imagine other parts of the country too. Yes. So talk a little bit about that. Well, um, that is something um, in the medical literature. They discovered that people with less sunlight have less vitamin D, and it does contribute to energy and fatigue. So I think it's a strong um, component of it. And it also, people take less of it in their diet. So you could supplement it just in your diet. But I think it has a strong combination with other nutrients that can benefit your mental well-being. Sure. So that's part of the holistic approach to Agreed. someone who Agreed. Yes. Has, has I forgot that. to mention, I also did a fellowship in integrative health. So I've learned a lot about, oh. like you said, um, what we can get in our diet that can supplement and help, you know, just hypertension, diabetes, things we eat and how much we eat For and what sure. we eat. That, so. makes, that makes really good mm -hmm. sense. So let's go to the last thing that you mentioned, which is antidepressants. Mm -hmm. So I... I presume, and again, this is probably something that needs to be tailored to the specific patient, but um, this would probably not be a, necessarily a first-line approach for someone with seasonal affective. Would you agree with that? Um, it would, again, depend on the patient mm -hmm. and depending on how severe it is, but it definitely um, would be on my list of um, treatment options. So it depends on the patient and making sure they don't have major depression that's masking a seasonal 
um, affective disorder. Okay. So it is one of the treatments, but it also depends on the patient. Like I'd like to get better sooner. Instead of waiting for the light to kick in, I might try the antidepressant with the light. So okay. it's also dependent on the patient and how severe the um, depression or seasonal affective disorder is. Is there a, a, a time frame that you might consider as a, a sort of a trial for antidepressants or, or, again, sort of patient dependent, right? Well, also it depends on the antidepressants. Some of them are more activating sooner. Mm -hmm. Some of them take a few weeks to work. So it depends on the patient their medical conditions, what other medications they're taking to make sure there isn't a drug-drug interaction. And then um, some, the one that is approved kicks in sooner than later. So that'd be a good kickstart for someone that was having like severe depressive symptoms. What medication is that? Wellbutrin. Wellbutrin, okay. Yeah. What would you say to someone who's listening right now who thinks that they, or maybe someone who they know or is close to them might be suffering from seasonal affective disorder? please call your doctor to schedule an appointment or a licensed psychologist because there is help out there. And be honest and open about your feelings and your mood and how long this has been going on. And there's a lot of treatment options and we're here to help you. Is this really in the wheelhouse of a primary care physician or is this something that should probably more be flowing through a, a mental health or behavioral health specialist? What do you think? I think it's both. Some of us um, practice more mental health, more mm -hmm. um, depression. But if the patient is more complicated, we do refer to psychiatry. But I think it's something a primary care physician and a psychologist can work together to help and handle a patient. But if it's beyond my scope, I will definitely refer to psychiatry. But like everything in life, it's a team approach. So I think there's a place for the primary care doctor. I think there's a place for integrative health. There's a place for the psychologist. And I always have them touch base with a psychiatrist because sometimes this is just the opening to Pandora's box of what else is underlying beneath. And it might just start out as this. And there might be a history of bipolar or personality disorder or an anxiety disorder. So being honest with yourself as a person and a patient and having that relationship with your primary care physician, we can guide you where you need to go to help you be the best person you can be. Speaking of sort of tangentially, what about a person who may be listening who maybe his or herself or someone they know may be having thoughts uh, or ideas about suicide? What, what should that person do? Please, please, please tell a family member, call your doctor. If you're even thinking about it, just call 911 and they will get you to the right place. And it's way too common out there, depression and suicide. And please, if you even think about it, let a friend or family member know or just call 911, call your doctor. There's so many resources out there. There's so many people that want to help. And there's someone that loves you and needs you and never forget that. No matter how bad it looks like, there's help out there. Please reach out and tell someone so we can help you. I want to thank Dr. Shella Jaffrey for being my guest on the podcast today. Thank you, Shella. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Do you want to pass along some resources for anybody who might be interested, like a, a web page sure. or a way to get more information about this? Yep. I um, researched this on the National Institute of Health and the Mental Health Department. I also love WebMD and also the American Academy of Family Physicians. Um, there's lots of information. Be very, very careful of the source. And please, please, before you try anything or do anything, call a friend, call your doctor. There's lots of people out there that can help you, and you're not alone. The, a lot of people suffer from this. It's very common, more than you know. And before we leave, I want to remind you to share any questions you might have with our email address, which is podcast at beaumont.org. Dr. Shah Jahan and I will be fielding your questions very soon. And with that, I will leave you with today's healthy thought. When the days are getting shorter, you might be feeling those energy levels start to dip and your mood might be dropping along with it. If this feels more than just a case of the winter blues, it could be a treatable condition called seasonal affective disorder. And it could be time to talk to your primary care doctor about it. Several approaches to treatment are available to help you manage this condition until the flowers start to bloom again. Continue your journey to living a smarter, healthier life. Visit Beaumont.org slash podcast to access information and resources related to today's podcast.